Module 3, Chapter 29 is critical care of the patients with respiratory emergencies. So we, we will be covering all emergencies from the vents to the different uh, traumas that could occur with your respiratory system. But I want you to back up to page 568 where it's got a pandemic of respiratory infections and we'll start there. On page 568, COVID-19 infection. This part ought to be very easy for you because we have actually lived this pandemic. Um, this started at the end of 2019 and it's still occurring now for us. Y'all all know this is a respiratory spread by droplets. So that's the reason that mass mandates are everywhere. Um, if you have a COVID positive patient in the hospital, you would have to wear N95 mask. Um, and we are not fit tested with that. So we don't want to put the liability on us right now while we're trying to get y'all through with school. Um, millions of people have died since this pandemic began. Some patients who develop COVID-19 are asymptomatic. They don't even have any symptoms. It might just tell you that they can't smell or can't taste. So it, it, it can go from a very minimal symptoms. Other might have minor respiratory symptoms similar to a cold or a flu and they will recover without any long-term effects. But then some of the older clients or people with pre-existing chronic conditions can have a fatal outcome. Um, typically, the symptoms appear two to four days after exposure of the virus. And if you look on page 568, this goes over some key features. Um, and one person might not have all of those. They might have one or two of them, but these are some of the key features there. And it goes up to most common symptoms, unique features of some patients and indication of emergency interventions. There are um, three vaccines. As y'all know, you've got your Pfizer, your Moderna, and your J&J, &J, your Johnson and Johnson. Uh, Pfizer is the only one of the, the three that is FDA approved. Um, so, but that is your choice if you want to get vaccinated. That is totally up to you. I'm not pushing that either way. Um, let's see what else. I, I think y'all pretty much know about the coronavirus. Inhalation anthrax on page 582. It is a bacterial infection caused by a gram positive organism. Most cases are cutaneous, just which means through the skin. Inhalation anthrax is fatal. When an occurrence happens, it is suspected as an intentional act. There are two stages. You got your prodromal your incubation period. You may think you have the flu or pneumonia. Some of the signs and symptoms that you will present with is low-grade fever, fatigue, mild chest pain, a dry, harsh cough. There will be no sore throat or rhinitis. Usually, the patient will start to feel better in two to three days. Um, if antibiotics are started at this time, the, the patient has a great chance of survival. If you look on page 582, this is the key features of the two stages. The fulfillment stage begins when the patient feels better. There is a sudden onset of severe illness with respiratory distress, bloody vomit shortness of breath, diaphoretic, strider, chest pain, high fever, decreased level of consciousness, and they'll be cyanotic. The disease spreads through the body causing septic shock. 
death often occurs within 24 to 36 hours, even with antibiotics are started. All right, chapter 29, we'll start with pulmonary embolism. This refers to an obstruction of the pulmonary artery or one of its branches by a thrombus or thrombi that originates somewhere in the venous system or in the right side of the heart. Deep vein thrombosis, a DVT, a related condition refers to the thrombus formation in the deep veins, usually in the calf or the thigh, but sometimes in the arm, especially in patients with peripheral inserted central catheters. That's the reason when one of your patients or when the doctor puts consult for a PIC placement, that PIC personnel or the IV team will come up there and they will talk with that patient about all the good that can come out of the PIC line, but they also is gonna have to tell them what chances that they are taking by getting that PIC inserted. Venous thromboembolism is a term that includes both DVT and PE. Large emboli obstruct the pulmonary blood flow, leading to reduced oxygenation, pulmonary tissue hypoxia, and potential death. Any substance can cause an embolism, but a blood, blood clot is the most common. PE is common, especially among hospitalized patients, and many die within one hour of the onset of symptoms or before the diagnosis has ever been um, suspected. So anytime your patients are telling you that, and that they are having shortness of breath, you need to go ahead and be on your P's and Q's and get in there and start doing your assessment on these patients. This slide just shows a pulmonary embolism. You can see it on the left-hand side of the screen. This slide just lets you visualize the embolus there that's in your lungs. Uh, you can see it on the left-hand side of the screen. Major risk factors for VTE, which is venous thromboembolism, leading to a PE is prolonged immobility. That's the reason they want you to try to get these patients out of bed and walk them up the chair, move them as much as possible. Central venous catheters, surgery, obesity, advanced aging, conditions that increase blood clotting, history of a thromboembolism in the past, also smoking, pregnancy, estrogen therapy, heart failure, cancer, or stroke, you're at risk for PEs also. Most commonly, PE is due to a blood clot or a thrombus, but there are other types of emboli, such as air, amniotic fluid and septic from a bacteria invasion of that thrombi. PE is a common disorder and often is associated with trauma, surgery, especially orthopedic, major abdominal, pelvic, uh, gynecological, pregnancy, um, heart failure, age older than 50, hyper, Coagulation states and prolonged immobility. Health promotion and illness prevention. Although pulmonary embolism can occur in healthy people and may give no warning, it occurs more often in some situations. Some preventions of conditions that lead to a PE is a major nursing concern. If you look on page 587, in that box, prevention of pulmonary embolism. These are some important points that you would need to review, especially like turning your patient, getting them out of bed um, as much as possible, because the longer they lay there, that's the more chance they have of uh, uh, getting PE. So that's the reason a lot of times you, 
You want to get them out of bed and get them moving. Ambulate patients, um, use those SCDs, but just make sure that you read over that, that box. It's very important. For patients at risk for PE, the most effective approach is to prevent DVT. Lifestyle changes can help reduce the risk for PE. Active leg exercises to avoid the venous stasis and early ambulation. And the use of anti-embolism stockings are general preventive measures. Urge patients to stop smoking especially women who take oral contraceptives, reducing weight and becoming more physically active, such as walking one or more miles each day can reduce the risk of PE. Teach patients who are traveling for long periods of time to drink plenty of water, change positions often, Avoid crossing the legs and get up from the sitting position at least five minutes out of every hour. For, <coughs> excuse me. for patients known to be at risk for PE, small dosage of heparin, low molecular weight heparin or a similar drug may be prescribed every eight to 12 hours. And that's the reason a lot of times at the hospital they will order your patient Lovenox or heparin sub-Q injections because they're, they're at risk because they're not mobile, they're, you know, they're bed bound or bed rest. Um, heparin prevents excessive clotting in patients after trauma or surgery or when restricted to bed rest. Occasionally, an antiplatelet drug such as Plavlix is used to in the place of heparin. Clinical manifestations. <coughs> Symptoms of the PE depend on the size of the thrombus and the area of the pulmonary artery occluded by the thrombus. They may be nonspecific. If you will look on page 588, this goes over some of your key features of PE. Dyspnea is the most frequent symptom. The duration and intensity of the dyspnea depends on the extent of the clot. Chest pain is common and is sudden, usually sudden and pleuritic in origin. It may be substernal or may mimic angina or MI. Other signs and symptoms include the patient will be very anxious. They'll have fever, their pulse will be up, they'll be very apprehensive. They'll have a cough, diaphoretic, hemoptysis, or syncope. The most frequent sign is a very rapid respiratory rate. Assess patients at risk for PE for the symptom of clustered of neck, distended neck veins, syncope, cyanosis, and hypertension. If these clusters is present, notify the rapid response team. So if you have those clusters, distended neck veins, syncope, cyanosis, and hypertension, you call a cat, you get help in there. Diagnostic test. Death from acute PE commonly occurs within one hour after the onset of symptoms. Therefore, early recognition and diagnosis are the nurse's priority. Initially, a clinical assessment will focus on the clinical probability of the risk, the clinical history of the patient, symptoms and signs, and testing. Because the symptoms of PE can vary from few to severe, a diagnostic workup is performed to rule out other diseases. The initial diagnostic workup include chest x-rays, a CT scan, ECG, pulse ox, arterial blood gases. They call it a VQ scan, a ventilation perfusion. The chest x-ray is usually normal, but may show infiltrates, atelectasis, elevation of the diaphragm on the affected side, or pleural effusion. 
the chest X-ray is most helpful in excluding other possible causes. Non-surgical management. If you look on page 589 at the bottom, management of pulmonary embolism. All right, measures are initiated to improve respiratory and vascular status. Oxygen therapy is administered to correct the hypoxemia, re relieve the pulmonary vascular vasoconstriction, and reduce pH. The use of anti-embolism stocking SCDs are elevating the legs above the heart, also increase that venous flow. Use a continuous pulse ox to monitor oxygen sats and hypoxemia. Assess vital signs every one to two hours and note in changes to the doctor. Drug therapy with anticoagulants may be prescribed to prevent embolus enlargement and to prevent new clots from forming. Heparin is usually used unless the PE is massive or occurs with the hemodynamic instability. A fibrolytic drug such as Activase may then be used to break up the existing clot. Now remember when you were taught in farm that once you get put on heparin, the clot that you already have, that heparin is not going to break it up. Then heparin is used to prevent any other clots from forming. Now, if you've already got a clot, your body is going to have to absorb and get rid of that clot for you. But if it's large enough, they will actually give you some uh, Fibrolytic drugs like Activase will break that clot up then. Review the patient's lab, such as their PTT and their PT, before therapy is started every four hours, when the therapy begins and daily therefore after. Therapeutic PTT values usually range between one and a half to two and a half times the control value um, for this healthy problem. What is the antidote for heparin? Protamine sulfate. What is the antidote for Coumadin? Vitamin K. I suggest you know those two. Most patients are started on oral Coumadin while they are stirred still on a heparin drip while in the hospital until their blood work is in range and then the heparin is stopped. So what they will do, they will, if you got clots, they use it, or PE, they will put you on heparin drip, and they will do daily labs on you to make sure that they are, they got it at the right units per hour, so you won't develop any new clots till your clotting time is within range. Once you're clotting time gets in range for your heparin, they will start you on Coumadin, usually at night time, once a day, uh, and then once that is in your system three or four days, they will stop the heparin and keep you on the PO Coumadin, because that is what you're probably going to be going home on. So you'll be on the heparin IV in the hospital, and then once your blood ranges get to a normal range, they will start the Coumadin PO, and then they will wait several days and keep checking your ranges, and once it gets in the normal range, they will stop your IV heparin and keep you on your PO Coumadin. And the reason they they will start you on Coumadin PO while you're on the heparin. It takes a little while before that Coumadin will start taking effect because they don't want to stop stop the heparin and put you right on the Coumadin because then you're, you can start clotting again. Both heparin and fibrolytic drugs are high alert drugs, so you know what that means, that you're going to have to have two licensed people to check 
and double check behind each other. These drugs have a high risk to cause harm if given too high or too low or the wrong patient. So that is the reason that you must have two licensed people to check behind each other. Um, remember, Lovinox and heparin sub-Q goes in your abdomen at a 90 degree angle. Don't aspirate and don't rub. All right, interventions. Managing hypoxemia. When a patient has a sudden onset of dyspnea and chest pain, immediately notify the rapid response team. Reassure the patient, elevate the head of the bed, prepare for oxygen therapy and blood gas analysis while continuing to monitor and assess for any other changes they may present with. Nurses' goal is to focus on increasing gas exchange improving lung perfusion, reducing risk for further clot formation, and preventing complication. And the nurse's priority intervention will include implementing oxygen therapy, administering anticoagulant therapy, monitoring the patient's response to the interventions, and providing psychosocial support. They're gonna be very anxious because they're having trouble breathing, so you need to have that uh, common response to them and don't be panicky and freaking out because if you start um, panicking, they're going to also. Oxygen therapy is a critical for the patient with PE. The severity of hypoxic pa patients may need mechanical ventilation and close monitoring with ABG studies. In less severe cases, oxygen may be applied by nasal cannula or even a mask. Use pulse ox to monitor oxygen saturation and hypoxemia. Monitor very closely their vital signs, lung sounds, cardiac and respiratory status at least every one to two hours. Document anything out of the ordinary, such as increasing dyspnea, dysrhythmias, distended neck veins, pedal or sacral edema. Listen to the lungs for crackles and other abnormal lung sounds. Assess lips for cyanosis. Look at their conjunctiva, their oral mucosis and nail beds. And drug therapy. Active, active bleeding, stroke, and recent trauma are reasons to avoid anticoagulant therapy, so you've got to know your patient. Each patient is evaluated to determine the risk versus the beneficial of anticoagulant therapy. Surgical management. A surgical embolectomy is rarely performed may be indicated if the patient has a massive PE or hemodynamic instability, or if there are other contraindications to thrombolytic therapy. Embolectomy can be performed using catheters or surgically. Surgical removal must be performed by a cardiovascular surgical team with the patient on a cardiopulmonary bypass. Although surgical embolectomy ensures removal of the clot, it is not without risk. An inferior vena cava IVC filter, and, and I've got a picture on the next slide for you, may be inserted at the time of surgery to protect against reoccurrence. IVC filters are not recommended for the initial treatment of a patient with PE. The IVC filter provides a screen in the in, inferior vena cava, allowing blood to pass through while the large emboli from the pelvic and lower extremities are blocked or fragmented before uh, reaching the lung. All right, this is the filter that I was talking about. It looks like a little umbrella, and you can see that it's just sitting there 
and the blood can flow through it, but if there is any clots, it will catch those clots before they get to your lungs or heart. Interventions. Fluid of choice is a crystalloid solution such as normal saline or Ringer's lactate to restore the volume and help prevent shock. Keep a close eye on the cardiac monitor, their eyes and nose, and their skin and turgor. Some drugs that are used when a patient has a low blood pressure is levofed, epinephrine, or dopamine. Some drugs that may be used to increase myocardial contractility are Dobertrex, D-O-B-U-T-R-E-X, or Primacor, M excuse me, P-R-I-M-A-C-O-R. Some vasodilators are nipride or nitropress, which are used to decrease pulmonary artery pressure. Bleeding, always assess every two hours for evidence of bleeding, such as oozing from IV sites, bruises that cluster, petechia or purpura, Examine all stools, urine, drainage, vomitus for gross blood and test for occult blood. Measure any blood loss as accurate as possible. Measure the patient's abdominal girth every eight hours. Increasing girth can indicate internal bleeding. Monitor lab values daily. Review the complete blood count. If the patient has severe blood loss, packed red blood cells may be prescribed. Monitor the platelet count. A decreasing count may indicate ongoing clotting or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia caused by the formation of the anti-heparin antibodies. Keep antidotes to coagulant drugs on hand. Heparin, remember, it's protamine sulfate, and warfarin is vitamin K. The patient with PE is very anxious and fearful, including the presence of pain, so they're hurting and they're very anxious because they can't breathe. Communication is critical in trying to alleviate that anxiety for that patient. Acknowledge the anxiety in the patient's perception of life-threatening situations. Stay with him or her, never leave them, and speak calmly and clearly, providing assurance that appropriate measures are being taken. When you give care to the patient, tell them what you are going to do when you are doing it. So talk to your patients. Drug therapy with an anti-anxiety drug may be prescribed if the patient's anxiety increases or it prevents adequate rest. Unless he or she is mechanically ventilated, sedating agents are avoided to reduce the risk of hypoventilation. When pain is present, pharmacological therapy is used for pain management. Care is taken to avoid suppressing that respiratory response. So you really have got to pay attention to your patient, assess them, listen to their lungs to make sure they're not getting over sedated. Community-based care. Before hospital discharged and at follow-up visits to the clinic, the nurse educates the patient about preventing reoccurrence and reported signs and symptoms. During follow-up or home care visits, the nurse monitors the patient adherence to the prescribed management plan and reinforces instructions. The patient is reminded about the importance of keeping follow-up appointments for their Coagulation tests and appointments with a primary provider. Because if they are going home on Coumadin, they have got to have weekly blood draws to see what their levels are. Um, and I think I told y'all this last semester, if you would hold your hands up and spell out heparin, 
How many fingers do you have left is three. So that means you check the PTT for heparin, spell out Coumadin, you'll have two fingers left. So then you check the PT for the Coumadin. So just think about that uh, when you're taking your test. Acute respiratory failure. Respiratory failure is a sudden and life-threatening deterioration of the gas exchange function of the lung and indication failure of the lungs to provide adequate oxygen and ventilation for the blood. Acute respiratory failure is defined as a decrease in your arterial oxygen tension, your PaO2, to less than 60, which means hypoxemia. Arterial oxygen sats less than 90% and an increase in arterial carbon dioxide tension, your PaCO2, to greater than 50, with an arterial pH of less than 7.35. Ventilator failure. In acute respiratory failure, the ventilation or perfusion mechanism in the lungs are impaired. Ventilator failure mechanisms leading to acute respiratory failure include impaired function of the central nervous system, such as drug overdose, head trauma, infection, hemorrhage, sleep apnea, neuromuscular dysfunction, such as your myosthenius gravis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, your ALS or spinal cord trauma, uh, musculoskeletal dysfunction such as chest trauma, malnutrition, pulmonary dysfunction. Um, and if you look on page 594, this goes over um, some common ca causes of uh, ventilator failure, and you can see the difference of extra-pulmonary causes and intra-pulmonary causes. Oxygenation failure. In oxygenation failure, chest pressure changes are normal and air moves in and out without difficulty but does not oxygenate the blood sufficiently. It occurs in the type of mismatch in which air movement and oxygen intake, which is your ventilation, are normal, but lung blood flow, which is your perfusion, is decreased. Many lung disorders can cause oxygenation failure. In one type of mismatch, areas of the lungs are still being perfused, but gas exchange does not occur which leads to hypoxemia. An extreme example of mismatch is when systemic venous blood passes through the lungs without being oxygenated and is shunted to the left side of the heart and it's into the systemic circulation. A classic cause of this mismatch is acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. And if you'll look on page 594, table 29.3, this goes over some specific causes of oxygenation failure. Combine ventilatory and oxygenation failure. A combination of ventilatory failure and oxygenation failure occurs in patients who have abnormal lungs like if you see with chronic bronchitis, emphysema, or are having an asthma attack. The bronchioles and alveoli are D disease, which causes oxygenation failure, and the work of the breathing increases until the respiratory muscles cannot function effectively, and that's where you have that ventilator failure occur. Acute respiratory failure results. You can see with patients who have cardiac failure along with the respiratory failure. 
This problem is serious because the cardiac system cannot adapt to the hypoxia by increasing the cardiac output. Dyspnea interventions. Always assess your patient for dyspnea. Dyspnea is more intense when it develops rapidly. Slowly progressive respiratory failure may first be noticed as dyspnea on exertion or when lying down. The patient may have orthopenia, finding it easier to breathe in an upright position with chronic respiratory problems. A minor increase in dyspnea may represent severe gas exchange problems. Assess for a change in respiratory rate in their pattern, a change in their lung sounds, pallor, are they cyanotic, do they have an increased heart rate, restless, confused, hypercapnia, um, high arterial blood levels or carbon dioxide. Pulse ox may show decreased oxygen sats but an arterial blood gas analysis is needed because that is the most accurate assessment for oxygenation. Oxygen therapy is appropriate for any patient with acute hypoxemia. It is used in acute respiratory failure to keep the arterial oxygen level above 60 while treating the cause of the respiratory failure. If oxygen therapy does not maintain acceptable PaO2 levels, the patient will have to be placed on a vent then. Help the patient find a position of comfort that allows easier breathing, usually in a more upright position. There are some patients that I have seen, they never get in their bed. They stay in their jerry chair because they're more upright and they can breathe better. Whatever is best for them, that's what you can do. To decrease the anxiety occurring with dyspnea, assist the patient to use relaxation, diversionary, or guided imagery. Start energy conserving measures, such as minimal self-care or no unnecessary procedures. And you might have to bathe them in piecemeals. And what I mean, you might have to go in there, fix your water, bathe them real good, you know, their head and face and neck, and then stop. Let them rest, come back in 30 minutes to an hour, do the trunk, and then come back in a few more hours and do the rest of it. But because doing the whole bath can actually wear your patient out. So you've got to use your patient as the guide. Drugs given for sustainability systemically or by meter dose inhaler, your MDIs may be prescribed to widen those bronchioles and decrease inflammation to promote gas exchange. Teach the patient how to use the inhaler appropriately. Encourage deep breathing and other breathing exercises. If they have an incentive spirometer, teach them how to use that appropriately also because that will get them lungs expanding and everything. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, your ARDS, can be thought of as a spectrum of diseases from its milder form, acute lung injury, to its most severe form as ARDS. This clinical syndrome is characterized by a severe inflammatory process causing diffuse alveolar damage that results in sudden and progressive pulmonary edema, increasing bilateral infiltrates on chest x-ray, hypoxemia, unresponsive to oxygen supplements. The patient will often demonstrate reduced lung compliance a wide range of factors are associated with the development of ARDS, which include direct injury to the lungs, such as smoking and inhalation, or indirect insult to the lungs, such as shock. The mortality rate is very high, and the majority of the death in ARDS is non-pulmonary MODS, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, often you see with sepsis.
causes of lung injury in ARDS. The nursing priority in the prevention of ARDS is early recognition of patients at high risk for the syndrome because patients who aspirate gastric contents are at great risk, closely assess and monitor those receiving tube feedings and those with problems that impair swallowing and gag reflexes. So if your patient has a NG tube or PEG, they need to make sure that they are at at least a 45 degree angle in that bed and not flat because they can aspirate very, very easy. Um, even if you get bolus feedings, you still need to keep that head elevated so they won't aspirate. Good infection control techniques are needed such as hand washing, invasive, invasive catheter and wound care are a must, contact precautions, teach CNAs the importance of always adhering to infection control guidelines, carefully observe patients who are being treated for any health problem associated with ARDS. Assess the breathing of any patient at risk for ARDS. Determine whether increased work of breathing is present, such as do you hear Norsby respiration? Are they cyanotic? Are they pale? Do they have retractions of the intercostal, you know, between the ribs or substernal below the ribs? Document any sweating, their respiratory effort, and any change in their mental status. Abnorm abnormal lung sounds are not heard on auscultation because the edema occurs first in the intersitual spaces and not in the airways. Assess vital signs at least hourly for hypotension, elevated pulse, and dysrhythmias. Report any abnormalities ASAP so they can get something done to help this before it goes into full-blown ARDS. Diagnostic assessment. The diagnosis of ARDS is established by collecting an ABG, which will show a lowered partial pressure of oxygen, arterial oxygen value, because a widening alveolar oxygen gradient, the patient has a progressive need for higher levels of oxygen. The patient does not respond to high concentration of oxygen and often needs to be intubated and put on a vent. A large difference between the predicted and actual, actual alveolar oxygen tension indicates shunning. Sputum cultures obtained by bronchoscopy and by tracheal suction are used to determine if a lung infection is present. The chest X-ray may show diffuse haziness or what they call white out appears appearance of the lung. A ECG rules out cardiac problems and usually shows no specific changes. Hemodynamic monitoring with pulmonary art lines help diagnose ARDS. Interventions. The patient with ARDS often needs to be intubated and placed on a vent with positive in expiratory pressure. They call it PEEP, P-E-E-P, -E -E or continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. Sedation and paralysis may be needed for adequate ventilation and to reduce tissue oxygen needs because one of the side effects of PEEP is tension pneumothorax. So always assess the lung sounds hourly and suction as often as needed to maintain a patent airway. Positioning may be important in promoting gas exchange but the exact position is controversial. Uh, some patients do better in the prone position, especially 
if they are started early in their disease process. And I know now uh, when a, a lot of times when the patients are placed in the unit and they have COVID, they try to get them in the prone position because they say they have a better chance of getting off that vent and getting that good flow through their lungs. Um, prone position may be achieved using a mechanical turning device. Although the turning equipment is very awkward and care in the prone position is more difficult, so you got to have a lot of people helping with that movement. Manually turning the patient every two hours had been shown to improve perfusion. However, this intervention often is not performed as frequently as needed. Um, Corticor steroids are used to manage ARDS because they decrease the white blood cell movement and reduce that inflammation and they stabilize capillary membranes. Antibiotics are used to treat any infection with organisms once they identified. Research shows that patients with ARDS who receive conservative fluid therapy have better lung function and a shorter duration on the vent and I see you length of stay compared with those who receive more liberal fluid therapy. Conservative fluid therapy usually uses smaller amounts of IV fluid along with diuretics to maintain that fluid balance whereas liberal fluid therapy often results in greater positive fluid balance and more systemic edema. Um, nutritional therapy, the patient with ARDS is at risk for malnutrition, which further reduces their respiratory function, muscle function, and their immune response. Adequate nutritional support is vital in the treatment of ARDS. Patients with ARDS require 35 to 45 kilocalories per kilogram per day to meet the caloric requirements. Enteral feeding is the first consideration or parental nutrition, nutrition with TPN is started as soon as possible. They'll be, they'll have a dietitian consult because just as soon as they can start them on TPN or NG feedings, they will because that, th these patients have a better chance of coming off the vent when they well um, have nutrition. This slide here just goes over different types of ET, ET tubes. I will show you in person some of the ET tubes and this is just a patient that has a endotracheal tube placed um, and we will go over how to insert it, how to maintain it uh, during the next few slides. Verifying tube placement. With mechanical ventilation, the patient who has severe problems of gas exchange may be supported until the underlying problem resolves or improves. Usually mechanical ventilation is a temporary life support technique. The need for this support may be lifelong for those with severe restrictive lung diseases or chronic progressive neuromuscular diseases that reduces the ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is most often used for patients with hypoxemia or for respiratory acidosis. Mechanical ventilation may be used for patients who need ventilator support after surgery, those who expend too much energy with breathing and barely maintain adequate gas exchange, or those who have general anesthesia or heavy sedation. So sometimes the patients with rest underlying respiratory problems, if they go to surgery and they come back, um, they might have to go to the unit and be on a ventilator for maybe 24 hours till their body and they can wake up. Once their body responds 
and they come off the anesthesia or the heavy sedation, they can be extubated or taken that tube out and sent to a normal floor. Assess the patient to be intubated in the same way as for other breathing problems. Once mechanical ventilation has been started, assess the respiratory system on an ongoing basis. Monitor and assess for problems related to their artificial airway or the vent settings. The patient who needs ventilator, ventilate, mechanical ventilation must have an artificial airway. The most common type of airway for a short-term basis is an endotracheal tube, they call it ET tube. A tracheostomy is considered if an artificial airway is needed for longer than 10 to 14 days to reduce that tracheal and vocal cord damage. The purpose of intubation are to maintain a patent airway, provide means to remove secretions, and provide ventilation and oxygenation. An ET tube is a long polyvinyl chloride tube that is passed through the mouth or the nose into the trachea. When properly positioned, the tip of the ET tube rests about two centimeters above your corona, the point at which the tracheal divides into the right and left bronchial. Oral intubation is a fast and easy way to establish an airway and is often performed as an emergency procedure. The nasal route is used for facial or oral traumas, surgeries, and when oral intubation is not possible. An anesthesiologist, nurse anesthetist, pulmonologist usually performs the intubation. The shaft of the ET tube has a radiopaque lining running the length of the tube. This line shows up on x-rays and is used to determine the correct tube placement. Short horizontal lines depth markings are used to place the tube correctly at the nares or mouth at the incisor tooth and to identify how far the tube has been inserted. The cuff at the distal end of the tube is inflated after placement and can create a seal between the trachea and the cuff. The seal ensures delivery of a set tidal volume when mechanical ventilation is used. When the cuff is inflated to an adequate sealing volume, a minimum amount of air can pass around the cuff to the vocal cords, nose, or mouth. The patient can not talk when the cuff is inflated. The cuff should be inflated using a minimum leak technique. The adapter connects the ET tube to a ventilator tubing or to an oxygen delivery system. The ET tube size is listed on the shaft of the tube. Adult sizes range from 7 to 9 millimeters. Tube size is selected based on the size of the patient. Preparing for intubation. Know the proper procedure for summoning intubation personnel in the facility to the bedside in an emergency situation. Explain the procedure to a patient as clearly as possible. Basic life support measures such as obtaining a patent airway and delivering 100% oxygen by manual resuscitation bag with a face mask are critical to survival until help arrives. For the patient requiring emergency intubation and ventilation, bring the code cart airway equipment box and suction equipment to the bedside. Maintain a patent airway through positioning and the insertion of an oral or nasopharyngeal airway until the patient is intubated. During intubation, the nurse continuously monitors for changes in vital signs, signs of hypoxia, dysrhythmias, or aspiration. 
ensure that each intubation attempt lasts no longer than 30 seconds, preferably less than 15 seconds. After 30 seconds, provide oxygen by mask, manually resuscitate them, and then uh, always check for hypoxia and cardiac arrest, suction as necessary. Immediately after an ET tube is inserted, placement should be verified. The most accurate way to verify are checking the end, tidal carbon dioxide levels and by chest x-ray. Assess for breath sounds bilaterally, systematic chest movement and air emerging from the ET tube. If breath sounds and chest wall movement are absent on the left side, the tube may be in the right main stem bronchi. The person intubating the patient should be able to reposition the tube without repeating the entire intubation procedure. If the tube is in the stomach, the abdomen may be distended and must be decompressed with the insertion of an NG tube. Monitor chest wall movement and breast sounds until tube placement is verified by your X-ray. Stabilizing the tube. Um, do not tape the tube too tightly to the nose or skin breakdown will occur. The nurse, respiratory therapist, or anesthesia provider stabilizes the ET tube at the nose or the mouth. The tube is marked at the level where it touches the incisor tooth or the nares. Two people working together use a head halter technique to secure the tube. So you've got to have two people helping hold that tube in place, hold the head, and then secure the tape appropriately. An oral airway also may be inserted or a commercial bite block placed to keep the patient from biting on the tube because when you first get this tube into place, the patient will feel it. They will start trying to gnaw on it and that could uh, loosen it and have it pulled out. One person stabilizes the tube at the correct position and prevents head movement while a second person applies the tape. After the procedure is completed, Verify and document the presence of bilateral and equal breast sounds and the level of the tube. So when everything gets said and done, that's when you take your stethoscope, you listen to those lungs, make sure you've got breast sounds on both sides. <coughs> make sure that you have marked the tube and that you have documented where the tube is so the oncoming nurse can make sure that they are keeping the assessment on the tube because they do move sometimes. Endotracheal tube nursing care. Assess tube placement, cuff length, breast sounds, and chest wall movement regularly. Prevent pulling or tugging on the tube by the patient to prevent dislodgement or slipping of the tube and check the pilot balloon to ensure that the cuff is inflated. Suctioning, coughing, and speaking can cause dislodgement. Neck flexion moves the tube away from the carni. Neck extension moves the tube closer. Rotation of the head also causes the tube to move. Mouth secretion and tongue movement can loosen the tape and change the tube place placement so you have got to be in there doing your assessment on the tube a lot. Uh, when other measures fail, obtain a prescription for soft wrist restraints and apply these for the patient who was pulling on the tube. But remember, restraints are used at last effort. Restraints are always used as last resort to prevent accidental extubation. Adequate sedation, which is considered a chemical restraint, may be needed to decrease, decrease agitation and prevent the patient from pulling out that tube. Obtain permission for restraints from the patient or the family. Complications of a ET tube or a nasotracheal tube can 
occur during placement, while in place or during extubation or after they have removed the tube. Trauma and other problems can occur to the face, the eye, the nasal, pharyngeal area, oral, pharyngeal, your bronchial, your tracheal, your pulmonary areas, uh, esophageal, gastric areas, cardio and cardiovascular, muscular, skeletal, and neuro neurological system. Remember this, D-O-P-E, displaced tube, obstruction, it could be due to secretions, pneumothorax, and equipment problems. That is what that stands for. So D-O-P-E, displacement of tube, obstruction, pneumothorax, and equipment problems. Always listen. Make sure all alarms on the vent are on and working. Always make sure you have an AMBU bag available when on a vent, so you should make sure that your patient has one in their room because you do not have time to run out of the room and try to find one. So always have it in the room when a vent patient. Mechanical ventilation. The purpose of mechanical ventilation are to improve gas exchange and to decrease the work needed for effective breathing. Sometimes your patient is just tired or they went through surgery and it might just take a little while for them to start breathing on their own appropriately. It is used to support the patient until lung function is adequate. A ventilator does not cure diseased lungs. It provides ventilation until the patient can resume the process of breathing on their own. Remember why the patient is using the ventilator so that management efforts also focus on correcting the causes of the respiratory failure. If normal oxygenation and ventilation and respiratory muscle strength are achieved, mechanical ventilation can be discontinued. Many types of ventilators are available. The ventilator selected depends on the severity of the breathing problems and the length of time ventilator support is needed. Most ventilators are positive pressure ventilators. During inspiration, pressure is generated that pushes air into the lungs and expands the chest. Usually, a ET tube or a tracheostomy tube is needed positive pressure ventilators are classified by the mechanism that ends in inspiration and starts the expiration process. Inspiration is cycled in three major ways. The first one is a pressure cycle, which means push air into the lungs until preset airway pressure is reached. This is used for a short period of time. The second one, time cycled, push air into the lungs until a preset time has elapsed, or volume cycled, which push air into the lungs until the preset volume is delivered. The mode of ventilation is the way in which a patient receives receives breath from the ventilator. Assist control, they call it AC ventilation, is used often as a resting mode. The ventilator takes over the work of breathing for the patient. The tidal volume and ventilator rate are preset. If the patient does not have a spontaneous breath, a ventilator pattern is established by the vent. It is programmed to respond to the patient's inspiratory effort if he or she begins to breathe. In this case, the ventilator delivers the preset tidal volume while allowing the patient to control the breathing rate. A disadvantage of the AC mode is that the ventilator continues to deliver a preset tidal volume 
even when the patient's spontaneous breathing rate increases. This can cause hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis. Investigate and correct the causes of hyperventilation, such as pain, anxiety, or acid-base imbalances. Then you have synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, the SIMV. This is similar to the AC ventilation in that the tidal volume and ventilator rate are present. If the patient does not breathe, a ventilator pattern is established by the vent. Unlike the AC mode, the SIMV allows spontaneous breathing at the patient's own rate and tidal volume between the ventilator breaths. It can be used as a main ventilator mode or as a weaning mode. When used for a weaning, the number of mechanical breaths is gradually decreased and the patient gradually res resumes that regular spontaneous breathing on their own. This action coordinates breathing between the ventilator and the patient. The bi-level positive airway pressure BiPAP provides non-invasive pressure support ventilation by nasal mask or face mask. It is most often used with patients with sleep apnea, but also may be used with patients with respiratory fatigue to avoid more invasive ventilator methods. And you guys might see this as you uh, are coming on at 6.30 in the mornings. You might see this. Uh, your patient still might be on the BiPAP uh, when you come in because this is what this, they might fall asleep. They might, uh, they might have sleep apnea or other disorders. Ventilator controls and settings. The volume cycled ventilator is the most widely used type in the acute care setting. Regardless of the type of volume cycled ventilator used, the controls and types of setting are universal. The physician prescribes the ventilator settings and usually the ventil ventilator is readily or set up by the respiratory therapist. The nurse assists, assists in the connecting the patient to the ventilator and they are the ones that actually monitor those ventilator settings because that respiratory therapist is going to be in and out of the room. Tidal volume is the volume of air the patient receives with each breath as measured on either inspiration or expiration. Rate or breaths per minute is the number of ventilator breaths delivered per minute. The rate is usually set between 10 and 14 breaths per minute. Fraction of inspired oxygen, your FiO2, is the oxygen level delivered to the patient. The prescribed FiO2 is based on the ABG values and the patient's condition. The oxygen delivered to the patient is warm to body temperature, your 98.6, and humidified to 100%. This is needed because the upper air passages of the respiratory tree, which normally warm and uh, humidify the air, are bypassed. So humidifying and warming prevent that mucosa damages. Peak airway inspiratory pressure, your PIP, um, is a pressure used by the ventilator to deliver a set tidal volume at a given lung compliance. And then you have your continuous positive airway pressure, your CPAP. This applies pressure, positive airway pressure throughout the entire respiratory cycle for spontaneous breathing patients. Sedating drugs are given lightly, if at all, when the patient is receiving CPAP so that respiratory effort is not suppressed. CPAP keeps the alveoli 
open during inspiration and prevent them from collapsing during expiration. CPAP is commonly used to help in the weaning process. During CPAP, no ventilator breaths are delivered. The ventilator just delivers oxygen and provides monitoring and alarm system. The respiratory pattern is determined by the patient's effort. Positive in expiratory pressure, your PEEP again, is a positive pressure exerted during exp expiration. PEEP improves oxygenation by enhancing gas exchange and preventing atelectasis. It is used to treat persistent hypoxemia that does not improve with a acceptable oxygen delivery level. The need for PEEP indicates a severe gas exchange problem. PEEP prevents alveoli from collapsing because the lungs are kept partially inflated so that the alveoli capillary gas exchange is promoted throughout the ventilator cycle. Nursing management. The use of mechanical ventilation involves a collaborative and complex decision-making process for the patient and the family and the entire healthcare team. Address the physical and the psychological concerns of the patient and family because the mechanical ventilator often causes them anxiety. Explain the purpose of the ventilator and acknowledge that the patient might feel some different sensations. So you need to explain what's going on to the patient and their loved ones. Encourage the patient and the family to express their concerns, ask questions, act as the coach to help and support them through this experience. Patient undergoing mechanical ventilation in ICUs often experience delirium or what they call ICU psychosis. These patients need frequent, repeated explanation and reassurance. When caring for a ventilator, ventilated patient, be concerned with the patient first, then the ventilator second. It is vital to understand why mechanical ventilation is needed. Causes such as excessive amount of secretion, sepsis, trauma, require different interventions for ventilator independence. In addition, you need to understand the patient's chronic health problems, so that's the reason that we want you to know their history, it's, especially if they have COPD, do they have left-sided heart failure, anemia, are they malnourished? These problems may slow the weaning from the vent and require close monitoring for interventions. Monitor and evaluate and document the patient's response to the ventilator. Assess vital signs and listen to breath sounds every 30 to 60 minutes at first and monitor respiratory parameters and check ABG values. Assess the breathing pattern in relationship to the ventilator cycle to determine whether the patient is tolerating it or are they fighting it. Assess and record breast sounds, including bilateral equal breast sounds to ensure proper ET tube placement. Determine the need for suctioning by observing secretion type, the color, and amount. Assess the area around the ET tube or tracheostomy site at least every four hours for the color, the tenderness, are they having skin irritation, is there any drainage, what color is it, does it smell, and document these findings. Monitoring provides information to guide the patient's activities such as weaning, physical or occupational therapy, and self-care. Because just because they on a vent, that don't mean they can't move around and help bathe themselves because there's a lot of them that are awake that is on that vent. They're all not sedated. The nurse spends the most time with the patient and is often the first person to recognize changes in vital signs and ABG values. And are 
and is the patient becoming fatigued or are they distressed? Promptly coordinate with the physician and implement the appropriate interventions if you see this happening. Um, serve as a resource for psychological needs of the patient and family. Anxiety can reduce tolerance for mechanical ventilation. Skilled and sensitive nursing care promotes emotional well-being and synchrony with the ventilator. The patient cannot speak and communication can be very frustrating and anxiety producing. So remember, you've got to have some kind of communication with them, pen and paper, a whiteboard, a picture board, just whatever it can be. The patient may panic for fear that the voice has been lost. Reassure them that the ET2 prevents speech only temporarily. Plan methods of communication. As I said before, you've got to find some type of communication because they can't talk. And make sure that you, when they ring the call button, that you go to them. Don't let them sit there because they're going to just panic more and more and more. Try to anticipate his or her needs and provide easy access to frequently used belongings, like their phones, because they can text. Uh, visit from family and friends and pets if allowed, can, and keeping a call out within reach can help them. Urge them to participate in uh, self-care activities. Ventilator settings are prescribed by the physician in conjunction with a respiratory therapist. Perform and document those settings according to the standards of the facility. Respond promptly to alarms. During a ventilator check, compare the pres prescribed ventilator settings with the actual settings that is on there. Check the level of water in the humidifier and the temperature of the humidifying system to ensure they are not too high. Temperature extremes damage the airway mucosa. Remove any condensation in the ventilator tubing by draining water into the draining collection receptacles and empty them every shift. Mechanical ventilators have alarm systems that warn of a problem with either the patient or the ventilator. Alarm systems must be activated and functioning at all time. Never ever turn them off because they're telling you something is wrong and you will hear that beeping and you can go in there and assess. If the cause of the alarm cannot be determined, Ventilate the patient manually with the AMBU bag until the problem is corrected by another healthcare professional. The major alarms on the ventilator indicate either a high pressure or a low exhaled volume. Assess and care for the ET or the tracheostomy tube. Maintain a patent airway by suctioning when you have secretions or if you hear wheezes decreased breast sounds. Proper care of the ET tube or tracheostomy tube also ensures a patent airway. Assess tube position at least every two hours and especially when the airway is attached to a heavy ventilator tubing that may pull on that tube. Position the ventilator tubing in such a way that the patient can move without pulling on the ET tube. If the ET tube moves, it can slip into the right main stem bronchus. To detect changes in the tube position, mark it where the tube touches the patient's teeth and nose. Give mouth care at least every two hours for hygiene and prevent loosening of the tape that holds that tube in place. Special attention is needed for the patient being transported while receiving mechanical ventilation. Monitor SpO2 levels during transport to assess ET2 placement and adequacy of the ventilation. Complications. Most problems are caused by positive pressure from the ventilator. Nearly every body system is affected. Cardiac problems from mechanical ventilated, blah, 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 ventilation include hypotension fluid and fluid retention. 
Hypotension is caused by positive pressure that increases chest pressure and inhibits blood return to the heart. The decreased blood return reduces cardiac output, causing hypotension, low blood pressure. Hypotension is most often seen in patients who are dehydrated or need high PIP ventilation. Teach the patient to avoid valsalva maneuver, you know, and that is just bearing down while holding their breath. Fluid is re retra retained because of decreased cardiac output. The kidney, kidneys receive less blood flow, which stimulates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system to retain that fluid. Humidified air in the ventilator system contributes to fluid retention. Monitor the patient's fluid intake and output. Weigh that patient, hydrate them, and signs of any hypovolemia. Lung problems from mechanical ventilation include barotrauma, damage to the lungs by positive pressure, or volatile value trauma, damage to the lung by excess volume delivered to one lung over the other, and acid-base imbalances. Barotrauma includes pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumomediastinum. Patient at high risk for bar barotrauma have chronic airway limitations, your cow have bleds or bully or peep, have dynamic hyperinflation or require high pressures to ventilate the lungs because of the stiff lungs as seen in acute respiratory distress syndrome as ARDS that we've already discussed. Blood gas problems can be corrected by ventilator changes and adjust the uh, fluid and elect electrolytes balances. All right, this is just a picture of the barotrauma. Note air in the neck. And you can see the error there as a consequences of ARDS in a patient receiving positive pressure ventilation. GI nutritional problems result from the stress of the mechanical ventilator. Stress ulcers occur in many patients receiving mechanical ventilation. That's when they will give them some type of antacids, caraphate, uh, histamine blockers, or proton pump inhibitors. They will give them these different types, and that will help with those stress ulcers. Changes in the chest and abdominal cavity pressure can lead to paralytic ileus. This problem reduces nutritional uh, absorption through the GI system and requiring short-term parental nutritional support. Because many other acute or life-threatening events occur at the same time, usually you just don't think about the nutritional status of that patient. Malnutrition is an extreme problem for those patients and is a main reason for failure to wean from a vent. In malnutrition, the respiratory muscles lose mass and strength. They just start wasting away. The diaphragm, the major muscle of inspiration, is affected early. When it and other respiratory muscles are weak, ineffective breathing results the patient becomes fatigued, and then the patient cannot be weaned off the vent. Balanced nutrition, whether by diet, enteral feedings, or parental feeding is essential during ventilation. Also, nutrition for the patient with chronic obstruction pulmonary disease, COPD, requires a reduction in the percentage of carbs in their diet. During metabolism, Carbohydrates are broken down to glucose, which then produces energy, carbon dioxide, and water. Excessive carb loads increase carbon dioxide production, which the patient with COPD may be unable to exhale. High 
hypercarbonic respiratory failure results then. Nutritional formulas with a higher fat content are your pulmonary care, your Nutrivent intralipids are calorie resources to help with this problem. Electrolyte replacement is also important because electrolyte influences muscle function. Monitor their potassium, their calcium, their mag, uh, phosphorus levels, and replace them as needed. So they'll be checking those metabolic uh, panels very often. Infections are a threat for patients using a ventilator, especially ventilator-associated pneumonia, your VAP. The ET or tracheostomy tube bypasses the body filtering process and provides a direct access for bacteria to enter the lower respiratory system. The artificial airway is colonized with bacteria within 48 hours of insertion, which promotes pneumonia development and increases morbidity. Aspiration of colonized fluid from the mouth or the stomach can be the source of infection. Infection prevention through strict adherence to infection control, especially hand washing during suctioning and care of the tracheostomy or ET tube is a major nursing role. To prevent pneumonia, perform oral care every two hours and implement pulmonary hygiene, including chest physiotherapy, postural drainage, turning and repositioning. Muscle deconditioning and weakness can occur because of immobility. Getting the patient out of bed and having them ambulate with help, perform exercises, not only improve muscle strength, but also boost their morale also. It helps with gas exchange and it helps promote oxygen delivery to those muscles. Ventilator dependent is the inability to wean off the ventilator. <coughs> this problem usually has psychological basis but can be, uh, excuse me, <coughs> it has a physiological basis but it <coughs> can be psychological. Excuse me, I'm choking. The longer a patient uses a ventilator, the more difficult is the weaning process because the respiratory muscle is fatigued and cannot assume the regular breathing. The healthcare team uses every method of weaning before a patient is declared unweanable. You will work with a physician, social worker, psychologist, and a member of the clergy to discuss whether the patient and the family uh, to discuss their end of life care, what are their goals, their values, <clears throat> as a result of this discussion, arrange for home ventilation, nursing home placement, or withdrawal of life support in terminal cases. Special units and facilities can maximize the rehabilitation and weaning of dependent patients. Remember when Miller County came, Miller County Hospital came and they were telling us about all the vents they have. That is what their specialty is. They have a wing just for patients that are on ventilators. So they have a special vent wing. Okay, weaning. Weaning is a process of going from ventilator dependence to spontaneous breathing on their own. The process is prolonged by complications. Many problems can be reduced with good nursing care. If you look on page 606, list various weaning techniques in the box at the bottom. So you can look at table 29.7 to go over different various weaning techniques. Extubation is the removal of the ET tube 
before removal, explain the procedure to the patient, set up the prescribed oxygen delivery system at the bedside, and bring in the equipment for emergency reintubation. Hyperoxygenate the patient and thoroughly suction both the ET tube and the oral cavity good. Then rapidly def deflate the cuff of the ET tube and remove the tube at peak inspiration. Immediately instruct the patient to cough. It is normal for a large amount of oral secretions to collect. Give oxygen by face mask or nasal cannula. Monitor vital signs after extubation every five minutes at first and assess the ventilator pattern for manifestations of respiratory distress. It is common for a patient to be hoarse and have a sore throat for a few days after the tube is replaced, so you need to tell them this. Teach the patient to sit in a semi filer's position, take deep breaths every half hour, use an incentive spirometer every two, and limit speaking. These measures help gas exchange, decrease laryngeal edema, and reduce vocal cord irritation. Observe closely for respiratory fatigue and airway obstruction. Early manifestation of obstruction or mild dyspnea, coughing, and the inability to clear secretions. Strider is a high-pitched, crowling noise during inspiration caused by laryngeal spasms or edema above or below the glottis. This sound is a late manifestation of a narrowed airway and requires prompt attention. Racemic epinephrine, a topical aerosol vasoconstrictor is given and reintubation may be needed. All right, now we're heading into chest trauma and we will go over each one of these that are on this slide. Um, in the next section of the lecture. Pulmonary contusion. A potentially lethal injury is a common chest injury and occurs most often with injuries caused by rapid deceleration during car crashes. After a contusion, respiratory failure develops over time rather than immediately. Hemorrhage and edema occur in between the alveoli, reducing blood, both lung movement and the area available for gas exchange. The patient becomes hypoxemic and dyspneic. The bronchial mucosa is irritated and secretions will increase. Patients may be asymptomatic at first and can later develop respiratory failure. Some signs and symptoms they might present with often have bloody sputum, decreased breath sounds, crackles, wheezes. At first, the chest x-ray may show no abnormalities. Management includes maintenance of the ventilator and ventilation and oxygenation. Monitor cerebral, excuse me, central venous pressure closely and restrict fluid intake as needed. The patient in obvious respiratory distress may need to be placed on a mechanical ventilation with positive end expiratory pressure to help inflate those lungs. A vicious cycle occurs in which more muscle effort is needed for ventilating a lung with a contusion and the patient becomes progressively hypoxic. The, this situation causes the patient to tire very easily, have reduced gas exchange, and become more fatigued and hypoxemic. Rib fractures are common injury to the chest wall, often resulting from direct blunt trauma to the chest. The force applied to the ribs fractures them and drives the bone ends into the chest. 
You may have a deep chest injury such as pulmonary contusion, a pneumothorax, or even a hemothorax. The patient has pain on movement and splints the chest offensively or, or defensively. Splinting reduces breathing depth and clearance secretions. If the patient has pre-existing lung disease, the risk for atelectasis and pneumonia increases. Management of uncomplicated rib fractures is simple because the fractured ribs will reunite spon spontaneously. The chest is usually not splinted by tape or other materials. The main focus is to decrease the pain so that adequate ventilation is maintained. An intercostal nerve block may be used if pain is severe. Analgesics that call respiratory depression are avoided. Frail chest is the inward movement of the thorax during inspiration with outward movement during expiration. It often involves one side of the chest and results from multiple rib fracture caused by blunt chest trauma, leaving a segment of chest wall loose, often as a result of a high-speed uh, car crash. It is more common in older patients and has a high mortality rate. The movement of the loose segment becomes opposite of the expansion and contraction movement of the rest of the chest wall. Frail chest can also occur from bilateral separations of the rib from their cartilage connections to each other anteriorly without an actual rib fracture. This condition can occur during cardiopulmonary resuscitation on older adults. Other injuries to the lung tissue under the frail segment may, may be present. Gas exchange, coughing, and clearance of secretion are impaired. Splinting further reduces the patient's ability to exert the extra effort to breathe and may contribute later to the failure to wade off the vent. Assess the patient with a frail chest for paroxysmal chest movement which is the sucking inward of the loose chest area during expiration and puffing out of the same area during inspiration. And you can see that in the diagram that's on the, the screen. The patient is often very anxious, short of breath, and they're in a lot of pain. Interventions include humidified oxygen, pain management, promotion of lung expansion, and deep breathing and positioning. And then you want to su those secretion clearance by coughing and tracheal aspiration. The patient with a fail, frail chest may be managed with vigilant respiratory care. Mechanical ventilation is needed if respiratory failure or shock occurs. You'll want to monitor the ABG values and the vital capacity very closely. With severe, severe hypoxemia and hypercarbia, the patient is intubated and mechanically ventilated with PEEP. With lung contusion or an underlying pulmonary disease, the risk for respiratory failure increases. Usually, Frail chest is stabilized by positive pressure ventilation. Surgical stabilization is used only in extreme cases. Monitor the patient's vital sign. The fluid electrolyte balances very closely so that hypovolemia or shock can be managed very quickly. If the patient has a lung contusion, monitor central venous pressure and give IV fluids as prescribed. Assess for and relieve pain with prescribed analgesic drugs by IV, epidural, the nerve block route. Give psychosocial support to the anxious patients 
by explaining all procedures that you are doing, talking slowly, calmly, and allowing time for them to express feelings and concern because they're going to be very nervous and anxious. So you need to be there with them and kind of calm them down. Tension pneumothorax. And you can see on the left is a pneumothorax. And then on the right, tension pneumothorax on the left with menial spinal shift to the right. You can see that in that picture there. All right, pneumothorax is any chest injury that allows air into to enter the pleural space results in a rise in chest pressure and a reduction in vital capacity. Severity depends on the amount of lung collapse produced. Pneumothorax is often caused by blunt chest trauma and may occur with some degree of hemothorax. It can also occur as a complication of a medical procedure. The pneumothorax can be open, pleural cavity is exposed to the outside air as through an open wound in the chest wall or closed, such as when a patient with COPD has a spontaneous pneumothorax. Assessment findings commonly will include reduced breast sounds on auscultation when you put that stethoscope on there, hyper renaissance on the percussion, prominence of the involved side of the chest, which moves poorly with respirations and a deviation of the trachea away from the effective side for the closed or toward the open for the, on the effective side. Tension pneumothorax, a rapidly developing life-threatening complication of blunt chest trauma results from an air leak in the lung or chest wall. Air forced into the chest cavity causes complete collapse of the affected lung. Air that enters the pleural space during inspiration does not exit during expiration. As a result, the air collects under pressure, compressing blood vessels and limiting blood return. This process leads to decreased filling of the heart and reduced cardiac output. If not promptly detected and treated, Tension pneumothorax is fatal. Causes include blunt chest trauma, mechanical ventilation with positive end expiratory pressure, closed chest drainage or chest tubes, and insertion of a central venous access catheters. Assessment findings with tension pneumothorax, you'll see asymmetric of the thorax, meaning one side will go up and the other side won't. Tracheal moving away from the midline toward the unaffected side. Respiratory distress. Absence of breast sounds on one side. Distended neck veins. Cyanosis. And hypertympanic sound on percussion of the affected side. Pneumothorax is detected on chest x-ray. ABG essays show hypoxia and respiratory alkalosis. A large bore needle is inserted by the healthcare provider into the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line of the affected side as an initial treatment for tension pneumothorax. You're trying to get the air out then a chest tube is placed into the fourth intercostal space and the other end is attached to a water seal drainage system until the lung reinflates. And we'll go over the chest tube and the pleurovac uh, during class. Hemothorax um, is a common problem occurring after blunt chest trauma or penetrating injuries. 
A simple hemothorax is a blood loss of less than 1,500 milliliters into the chest cavity. A massive hemothorax is a blood loss of more than 1,500 milliliters. Bleeding is caused by injury to the lung tissue, such as lung contusions or lacerations that can occur with real or sternal fractures. Massive internal bleeding and blunt chest trauma may stem from the heart, great vessels, or the intercostal arteries. Assessment findings vary with the size of hemothorax noted. If, a, if it is small, the patient may not have any symptoms. With a large hemothorax, the patient may have respiratory distress. In addition, breath sounds are reduced on auscultation. Percussion on the involved side produces a dull sound. Blood in the pleural space is visible on chest X-ray and confirmed by thoracentesis. Interventions focus on removing the blood in the pleural space to normalize breathing and to prevent infection from occurring. Anterior and posterior chest tubes are inserted to empty their pleural space, closely monitoring of chest tube drainage. You'll have chest, chest x-rays are used to determine treatment, treatment effectiveness. An open thoracotomy is needed when there is initial blood loss of 15 to 2,000 milliliters from the chest and persistent bleeding at the rate of 200 milliliters over three hours. Monitor the vital signs and blood loss in eyes and O's. Assess the patient's response to the chest tubes and infuse IV fluids and blood products as prescribed. Blood loss to the chest drainage can actually be infused back into the patient. So that's pretty neat to me. And we'll go over the, the, the chest tube because I know some of y'all have never seen them or worked with them. All right, the first case study, a 65-year-old woman is brought to the ED by her husband with new onset, shortness of breath. She had an abdominal hysterectomy five days ago. Her husband states that she stayed in bed since she was discharged from her surgery 48 hours ago because she feels very short of breath when she gets up. What risk factors are present for DVT? And if you answered prolonged immobility because she's not getting up, she's 65 years of age, so advanced aging and the recent surgery. During triage, the following vital signs and assessments are noted. You've got temperature 99.6, pulse 126, sinus tack, labored, O2 sats is 84%, room air bilaterally, petechia across the chest and in the auxilla, blood pressure 80 over 44, respiration is 28, and they have crackles. Based on these findings, what do you suspect might be happening with this patient? The patient may have a pulmonary embolus. She could also have pneumonia based on her recent surgery and the immobility. Further assessment should be performed to ascertain the specifics of her symptoms. When the ED physician is notified of the patient's manifestation, she is moved immediately to a treatment room. The physician writes the following orders. O2 at two liters per nasal cannula, STAT, CBC, BMP, D-dimer, a PTT, and INR. STAT, CT of the chest, start a saline lot. Which order takes priority at this time? So this will be the order. 
based on the patient's pulse ox reading, the priority order is to administer the oxygen first. Next, the saline locks should be started. Once the vein is accessed, blood can also be obtained for the labs. And after the lab specimens are sent, the radiology department can be notified to perform the STAT CDC. Now you will be having a lot of these type questions on NCLEX. What would you do first? What order would you do them? So you need to start getting used to these type questions. While in the treatment room, the patient says she needs to use the bathroom. The nursing assistant is delegated this task. What is the best approach for the nursing assistant to take? Place the patient on a bedpan and stay with her until she is finished. B, ambulate her into the hall bathroom on room air and stand outside the door until she's through. Ask the patient for indwelling catheter because of her shortness of breath when she ambulates. Tell her to try to wait until shortness of breath subsides. If you chose A, you are correct. You never ambulate her because of what's going on with her, and especially on room air, and you don't want a catheter unless there's no other choice and you don't want to, uh, to ask her to wait till you get through with whatever you're doing. So the answer is A. Two hours later, the patient is admitted to the medical unit where she is started on continuous IV heparin weight-based protocol, which finding in indicates that the heparin infusion is therapeutic. All right, A, INR is less than one. B, INR is between two and three. APT is the same as the control. D, APTT is 1.5 to 2.5 times the control. If you guess D, you are correct. When a patient is started on continuous heparin, the PTT is drawn before therapy is started and then every four hours until a therapeutic range of 1.5 to 2.5 times the control is reached. And then thereafter, the APT is checked daily. Three days later, the provider pre prepares to discharge the patient on Coumadin. Which teaching points do you include after this therapy? Select all that apply. A, be sure to have follow-up INR laboratory tests done. B, report any bruising, bleeding to your provider. C, consume lots of foods that are rich in vitamin K, such as green leafy vegetables. D, use a soft toothbrush to brush your teeth and electric razor to shave your legs. E, a skin rash is expected while you are taking the drugs. A, B, and D are the appropriate select all that apply because you want them to keep their test to follow up. You need to report any bleeding to the pr provider. You do not want to eat green leafy vegetables because that's going to get your blood thinner. Use a soft toothbrush to brush your teeth. That is correct. Which patient is at greatest risk of developing acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS? Is it a 24-year-old male admitted with blunt chest trauma and aspiration at the scene? a 56-year-old male with a history of alcohol abuse and chronic pancreatitis, a 72-year-old male post-heart valve surgery receiving one unit of packed red blood cells, 82-year-old female on antibiotics for pneumonia. The answer is A. All patient scenarios create a risk for ARDS 
However, the trauma patient with direct chest injury and known aspiration is at greatest risk. ARDS risk factors include direct lung injury, like aspiration of gastric contents, symmetric uh, illnesses, injuries, and the most common risk factors for ARD is sepsis. A patient is going home on Coumadin therapy to manage an acute pulmonary embolism. Which patient response indicates further discharge teaching? So you need to further teach this patient. I should make doctor's appointment for weekly blood draws. I should take the medication at the same time every day. I should eat more green leafy vegetables like spinach. I should limit my alcohol consumption. The one that you should choose that needs more teaching would be C. Patients who experience venothromboembolism, pulmonary embolism, are frequently discharged on anticoagulant therapy like your Coumadin. The patient should be educated on what to eat and the risk and monitoring of the drug. They need to avoid foods like uh, green leafy vegetables, green tea, alcohol, cranberry juice. So you will do a lot of teaching when this patient first starts on this warfarin or Coumadin therapy. A patient in acute respiratory failure is classified as having ventilator failure. A potential cause of ventilator failure is A, opiate analgesic overdose. That would be the one because acute ventilator failure is a type of problem in oxygen intake and carbon dioxide removal and blood delivery that causes a ventilation perfusion mismatch in which perfusion is normal by ventilation is inadequate. It occurs when chest pressure does not change enough to permit air movement into and out of the lungs. And as a result, too little oxygen reaches the alveoli and carbon dioxide is retained. Opiate analgesic overdose is possible cause of ventilator failure. The other listed is related to oxygenation failure.